right, hello, good morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our third annual Stanford AFM Thirst Workshop, organized by Nano at Stanford in collaboration with, and with great support from, Hariba Scientific. The previous two workshops were hosted in person on Stanford campus and also included several hands-on Thirst sessions on our Hariba Labram Evolution HR Thirst equipped instrument available at Stanford Nano Shared Facilities. This year, however, due to unprecedented circumstances, we had to move the event to an online platform, as otherwise it would have to be canceled. The advantage of hosting this workshop online is that we could invite a much larger audience that otherwise would not be able to participate in an on-campus event. So again, welcome, and I am glad that you could join us today for these three wonderful seminars. Before we start, I would like to make a couple housekeeping announcements. Um, if you would like to ask questions to the presenter, please use the Q&A button on the bottom and type your questions there. <clears throat> we will be answering questions at the end of each talk. In case we don't manage to answer all the questions, the presenters will do their best to follow up via email. Therefore, do not ask questions anonymously because we will not be able to figure out how to respond to you in that case. There will be 15 minute breaks between the talks, so you don't have to sit for three hours straight. And at the end of the event, you will receive a feedback survey. And it would mean a lot to me if you could take two minutes and just give us feedback about what you thought about this event. All right, with that out of the way, let me hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Andrei Krajev, the number one terse person at Hariba Scientific. Um, Andrei has been instrumental to the success of our past workshops, and I am very grateful that he agreed to help with the online event as well. Andrei, please share your screen. Okay, uh, can you hear me well, Arsen? Yes, yes I can. Okay, excellent. Uh, good morning or whatever part of the day it is in your specific location. Uh, I will join Marcin uh, in thanking everyone who is attending this event. I hope it will be interesting, educative, and to at least some extent will restore the sense of normality in our crazy time. Okay, with that, uh, let's start uh, the presentation. Uh, today I will be talking about uh, terms for nanoscale imaging of lateral heterostructures of 2D materials. And here is the outline of my talk, a uh, very brief introduction to terms. I know that both Patrick and Tom will also repeat. Andrew, uh, we cannot see your screen. Sorry? We cannot see your screen. You're not sharing yet. Oh. Share. Yes. Okay. My apologies. Uh, so presentation overview, uh, brief introduction to TERS, uh, then I will talk about uh, what Hariba has to offer to scientific community in terms of TERS instrumentation, then we'll switch to science and uh, I will present the results of our collaborative work with our uh, partners in uh, academia on two uh, imaging of uh, two D material heterostructures. Uh, very brief introduction of new uh, instrument uh, that Hariba has to offer this year, and very exciting new technology uh, provided by our partner company on. Uh, nitrogen vacancy magnetometry. Okay, so tip enhanced Raman scattering, or briefly TERS, is a combined technique that uh, integrates the advantages of surface enhanced Raman scattering and scanning probe microscopy uh, in a way that when we place a plasmonic structure at the apex of the SPM probe, and to illuminate uh, the structure with uh, external laser, the optical field uh, gets great, uh, both the incoming field and the scattered field gets greatly enhanced uh, by the plasmonic structure that serves as a nano-antenna uh, that confines the field into nanoscale 
uh, volume, thus uh, enhancing sensitivity and uh, more, uh, even more importantly, the spatial resolution uh, of uh, Raman imaging that becomes comparable or sometimes even better than the spatial resolution provided by corresponding scanning probe microscopy technique. So when we scan the sample under the tip under illumination, uh, we can get a full Raman spectrum or PL spectrum or combined spectrum Raman and PL uh, in every pixel. And then we can analyze the composition of the sample based on the Raman signature or uh, PL peak position. And as I mentioned before, the spatial resolution can become uh, much better compared to what it is in the confocal Raman imaging. And uh, there have been a number of reports in literature where uh, actually scientists demonstrated submolecular resolution in uh, terse imaging in ultra high vacuum conditions. Okay, so instrumentation wise, Hariba has a very extensive line of uh, products devoted for combined uh, AFM with optical spectroscopy. Our flagship Omega scope uh, designed for non-transparent samples with top and side optical access and trios, a very uh, flexible universal access platform with top, bottom and side where uh, scientists can do all sorts of crazy experiments with split excitation collection, collection through multiple channels and so forth. And any of these instruments can be coupled to our Raman line of products, uh, Compact Explorer, something that I have in my lab, uh, very high spectral resolution and powerful instrument, Labram HR Evolution, or uh, our brand new uh, Raman spectrometer, uh, Labram Select. So any combination of these instruments is possible and it can provide high quality tip enhanced Raman or tip enhanced photoluminescence imaging. What makes our instrumentation unique is the fact that when we started to design the uh, AFM, we designed it with idea that it's gonna be integrated with optical spectroscopy. And uh, we had to make a number of uh, difficult technical decisions uh, for that purpose. And I will list a few of the most important. First of all, the feedback laser in our uh, AFM is infrared. It's 1300 nanometers. So it's invisible to naked eye. It's invisible to silicon-based video CCDs, uh, which brings us to the next advantage in our instrumentation. The alignment of the AFM cantilever to feedback laser is fully motorized and fully automated. It doesn't matter whether a person is very experienced or a complete novice. Uh, the alignment of the AFM cantilever to feedback laser can be done within seconds with uh, ultimate perfection, regardless of the experience of the user. The design of the AFM heads allows high numerical aperture access because this is of utmost importance for uh, optical spectroscopy. The higher NA we have in our objectives, the better the light collection and the higher the signal to noise ratio. So we can do up to 0.7 NA from the top or uh, 0.75 uh, NA from the side. And of course the bottom access and trios can go up to 1.4 with oil immersion objectives. Uh, another important thing which makes the use of, the, uh, of our instrumentation uh, convenient is the possibility to see the apex of the FM probe or more generally SPM probe uh, from the side camera, which makes the alignment uh, very easy and intuitive. So for tip enhanced Raman scattering or tip enhanced photoluminescence, uh, you can imagine that it's very important to keep the alignment of the uh, Raman laser, of the focus of Raman laser and the apex of the tip uh, stable and very precise. And uh, our solution for that was to use the XYZ closed loop objective scanner. Uh, this scanner is as accurate as an AFM scanner and actually uh, it allows to move the objective with nanometer precision. In some custom setups, actually this 
scanner is used as an AFM scanner. And since we are moving the very last optical element in front of the, uh, of the SPM probe, uh, the stability uh, and the fact that we have closed loop uh, and flexure based design in the scanner, the stability of alignment is extremely good uh, and we can keep the alignment perfect for hours, uh, which allows to collect multiple terse maps, even with fairly high pixel density. Another important thing is that uh, we, we are very proud to contribute uh, significantly to, to the methodology of tip enhanced trauma scattering measurements. And for this, we were granted a patent and uh, I can say that today we have in our suite of software about eight dedicated terse imaging modes. Okay, so uh, one thing uh, which I always stress in my presentations is uh, the fact that when we integrate scanning probe microscopy with uh, optical spectroscopy, it's always a two-way road. It is not just the improved uh, sensitivity and dramatically improved spatial resolution that scanning probe microscopy provides for uh, optical spectroscopy in, in, in the form of uh, tip enhanced RAM and tip enhanced PL. The uh, ability to collect scanning probe microscopy information either under illumination or in the dark makes uh, expands dramatically the capabilities of uh, such system. And now when we can add light to scanning probe microscopy measurements, we can probe uh, the optoelectronic, optomechanical or photovoltaic properties of different materials, which as you can imagine, quite important in uh, uh, these days for, for the research community. Okay, let's move forward. Uh, so the core of uh, integrated AFM Raman system or AFM optical spectroscopy system is the AFM itself. And we are proud to have uh, one of the best AFMs on the market. I won't be shy to say that. Uh, it's very powerful. We have a lot of uh, all the uh, standard techniques and a lot of uh, unique custom imaging modes. Uh, and just to name a few, of course, standard Kelvin uh, probe microscopy, but we also have uh, frequency modulated Kelvin uh, capacitance uh, microscopy, which allows you to probe the uh, consideration of the free uh, charge carriers, uh, nanolithography, very precise and very accurate, both raster and vector. Uh, we have excellent current sensing unit in our instrument that allows uh, measurements of uh, currents down to fraction of picoampere and also unique scanning imaging mode that allows to uh, perform this conductivity measurement even through a very loosely attached uh, objects like uh, carbon nanotubes, for example, on the, on the surface. Uh, when we combine our AFM with uh, light, we can probe uh, optoelectronic properties, uh, photoresponse of different materials. Of course, we have uh, an option of imaging and liquid, uh, piezo response, magnetic force microscopy, electric, electrostatic force microscopy, and many more uh, advanced imaging uh, techniques. The core of our AFM, the scanner, is actually fairly unique. And even though it was designed already 12 years ago, it still holds the uh, number one position in terms of the quality factor, which is the range times the resonant frequency along corresponding axis. And uh, our scanner is fairly large in terms of the range. So it's 100 by 100 microns uh, in uh, XY and 15 micrometer in Z. So we can image very rough samples. Of course, we can nicely image uh, even complex samples like uh, practically spherical nanoparticles, but with the same scanner, we can confidently do molecular resolution with closed loop uh, in XY on, and we can go down to atomic resolution. So one scanner does it all. You don't have to sacrifice resolution for the range or the other way around. 
And the design of the scanner is, uh, it's not based on the piezo tubes, it's based on the uh, actuators and flexure uh, guides, which makes the scanner very stiff. Uh, it's by design uh, not really vulnerable towards the uh, thermal drift. And uh, as you can see, it can produce a number of uh, excellent uh, FM images. Uh, I would like also to stress the importance of having the AFM uh, with uh, XY closed loop control. Uh, this control eliminates the creeps uh, in uh, actuators in the piezo scanner and allows you to be exactly in the position that you want to be. And uh, as you can see in this example, this uh, AFM image of uh, molecular self-assembled layers on the HOPG uh, collected with XY closed loop on shows that we can do a quite nice job even at uh, nanoscale. Uh, and uh, another important thing is that this sort of measurement is actually a QC test. Every single instrument that leaves the factory is um, passing this sort of uh, measurement and it's, do uh, it's done by our uh, assembly engineers, not our application scientists. So this sort of measurement is uh, easy to do. And uh, this is one of the demonstrations how good our AFM is. Okay, so I hope that uh, I managed to convince you that uh, we have a very nice tool. And uh, now I would like to talk how useful can the combination of uh, AFM and Raman microscopy be for characterization of 2D materials. And uh, I think everybody knows that after the discovery of graphene, the amount of uh, efforts uh, invested by research community into to the world uh, surged dramatically and together with funding for this sort of research. So uh, I really like the title of this paper that uh, showed up in Nature Photonics in 2016, Why All the Fuss About 2D Semiconductors. And uh, after the discovery of graphene, it turned out that actually the number of uh, Van der Waals materials that can be exfoliated in the form of a single atom or a single molecular sheet is actually huge. Uh, we have thousands of uh, possible materials and only about 70 have been actually synthesized. The Nice uh, and great thing about uh, this diversity is that these uh, two-dimensional materials, they cover all spectrum of the properties from uh, semi-metallic or metallic, uh, like graphene or some transitional metal decalcogenides, and then narrow band gap semiconductors, the modest band gap semiconductors, and all the way uh, up to uh, good dielectrics like baron nitride. So, in the uh, family of two-dimensional materials, we can pick up pretty much anything we want in terms of the band gap width and the nature of that uh, band gap in terms of uh, whether the semiconductor is direct band, band gap or not. Okay, so, and uh, another interesting thing, if we come to a important class of uh, these two-dimensional semiconductors, namely transitional metal decalcogenides. Uh, it is important to mention that most of the optoelectronic properties in these materials are mediated by excitons, which happily survive uh, in at room temperature because of huge binding energy. Therefore, uh, the, these materials, they feature a number of uh, excitonic resonances and uh, which allows in its turn to provide resonant excitation conditions for Raman spectroscopy. And uh, with, uh, when we hit a, one specific resonance, uh, we, we, we can see many more Raman peaks in our Raman spectrum compared to non-resonant excitation. And in this slide, you can see this uh, comparison of the same sample uh, probed with non-resonant uh, excitation at 2.7 TV 
and uh, resonant excitation with red, we, we, with resonant excitation, we can see many more peaks. And uh, this makes our life more interesting and more difficult at the same time because interpreting all those peaks that uh, we observe with resonant Raman sometimes becomes challenging, but uh, having this wealth uh, of information and the choice whether we can do resonant or non-resonant excitation is a great advantage for characterization of these materials. So for to d semiconductors, uh, scanning probe microscopy can provide uh, fairly uh, extensive uh, list of information. So, of course, topography, and if you look at uh, all the publications on uh, 2D materials, practically every single one has at least one AFM image. Uh, so we can probe adhesion, stiffness, surface potential, which is very important, actually, uh, conductivity, capacitance, for the current uh, across the uh, 2D sheet. Optical spectroscopy uh, is also very popular, particularly Raman and uh, photoluminescence spectroscopy uh, that uh, can provide the information about the structure of the two-dimensional semiconductor, uh, the electronic band arrangement through the PL position and PL uh, peak shape and mechanical strain uh, in the form of uh, shift of Raman peaks uh, in the spectra, doping, uh, photocurrent along the sheet, and so forth. When we combine these two lists together in form uh, of TERS and tip, uh, or tip enhanced photoluminescence, we can do both of these lists at nanoscale. And this is really important because uh, many uh, heterogeneities that we observe in uh, two-dimensional materials, they are really of uh, nanometer scale and cannot be probed with conventional optical spectroscopy, which has natural limit of uh, uh, wavelength of light, which is about a few hundred of nanometers. And uh, I'm very happy to say that our instrumentation proved to be very productive in terms of characterization of uh, two-dimensional materials. And uh, this is a brief uh, list of publications uh, strictly devoted to tip-enhanced Raman scattering or tip-enhanced photoluminescence done on Hariba instruments uh, published in 2018. Uh, and we have a number of papers published earlier and 2019. Also, uh, we have, we are looking at very successful year. This year, just on Monday, we had two papers accepted and counting. Okay, so let's talk about the rich physics and diversity uh, of properties in transitional metal decalcogenides. So TMDCs, uh, they are van der Waals materials that consist of a layer of uh, transition metal. Uh, most, mostly used is molybdenum or tungsten. And this layer of uh, metal atoms uh, is sandwiched between the two layers of calcogen, either sulfur, selenium, or tellurium. In most fo uh, stable form, uh, these materials, they are semiconductors and in uh, single layer uh, limit, they are direct band gap semiconductors. As you can see in this uh, band structure uh, diagram, the diversity of the width of the band gap and the work function of the materials is quite uh, extensive. So we can have narrow band gap semiconductors, uh, mostly based on tellurium, uh, high band gap semiconductors based on sulfur and the position of the Fermi level can vary quite dramatically, which makes it very enticing to combine these uh, materials together, either in the form of vertically stacked materials or growing lateral heterostructures, thus arranging PN junctions and other interesting electronic formations based on 
realistically atomically thin uh, materials. So now we'll talk about the uh, heteromonolayers of uh, these uh, transitional metal decalcogenides. So luckily, uh, chemists and material scientists figure out, uh, figured out quite some time ago uh, that it's absolutely possible to synthesize this sort of materials. And of course, uh, one can imagine that in ideal world, we would like to have full control of the interface between the material A and material B. And sometimes, as we can see in these uh, TEM images, we can have almost atomically sharp edges, but more general and uh, uh, probably uh, the most abundant uh, situation in the uh, synthesis of these uh, lateral heterostructures is uh, uh, the situation when we have gradual transition from material A to material B, thus having some uh, sort of alloyed area. And uh, following, I will present the results of uh, TERS characterization, TERS and PL characterization of uh, uh, molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide lateral heterostructures that we did in uh, collaboration with uh, three different groups, a uh, group of Patrick Kuhn in the University of Alabama, uh, Husey Davis, Professor Gang Yu, and uh, our good friend Nicholas Boris, who is now in Montana State University. So these uh, crystals with uh, molybdenum disulfide core and uh, tungsten disulfide shell were synthesized on uh, sapphire substrate and here you can see uh, optical image of uh, these crystals and uh, the image of the cantilever positioned over the crystal that we will be mostly talking about in uh, further presentation. So when we took uh, FM image, luckily we managed to find a location where the charging of the underlying sapphire crystal was not very significant so the topography looked normal, very flat, and almost no variation in terms of height between the molybdenum disulfide core and uh, tungsten disulfide shell. But in the surface potential image and in the capacitance image, we could clearly see the difference between the uh, two different materials. So first, we characterized uh, this uh, structure with conventional confocal microscopy, and uh, we collected uh, a quite nice confocal map. We see that along the junction line between the molybdenum disulfide core and tungsten disulfide shell, there is a transition area that shows quite significantly increased uh, photoluminescence signal. This map was collected with 638 nanometer laser but when we collected the same map uh, with green laser, which allows us to see the full uh, PL peak of tungsten disulfide, which is located at around 630 nanometers, actually it turned out that the transition area actually has slightly less intense peak, but quite significantly widened and uh, quite significantly redshifted. So it's a very direct indication that something interesting is going on in the transition area between molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide. But the spatial resolution of conventional confocal microscopy, which in our case was about uh, half a micron, is not sufficient to actually resolve what's going on uh, at nanoscale. And in order to uh, figure out and uh, uh, and probe the nanoscale distribution of the structural properties in this heterostructure, we transferred these uh, crystals to gold following the recently published procedure. So we took the carrier wafer with the crystals, then uh, evaporated gold on top, then we glued a transfer wafer with thin layer of epoxy, and then we stripped the crystals uh, from the carrier wafer 
And thus, uh, thus we obtained a situation when our crystals were embedded in the gold layer. And that provided us with the possibility to run tip enhanced Raman scattering measurements in so-called uh, gap mode when the thin sample is sandwiched between plasmonic or highly reflective metal and uh, terse probe, which greatly confines the uh, optical field in this gap and enhances the signal dramatically. So uh, by doing this, we have the possibility to get a uh, strongly enhanced signal and the best uh, spatial resolution possible. So the good news was that we were able to find exactly the same flake that we characterized uh, before with conventional confocal microscopy. And as you can see, here are this uh, very specific formation. We can see it here in the transferred sample and the crystal that we analyzed uh, in the before the transfer is exactly the crystal that we analyzed after the transfer to gold. So topography is expectedly was very smooth because uh, realistically we were looking at the replica of uh, extremely well polished uh, silicon wafer uh, and uh, the contact potential difference of Kelvin probe microscopy information was uh, showing very nicely uh, the presence of this coarse shell structure, uh, molybdenum disulfide core and tungsten disulfide shell. And uh, to compare it with the original topography image to kind of confirm once again that we are dealing exactly with the same crystal, uh, you can see uh, the right image here, that's the flipped topography image of, uh, of the original crystal on, on the growth vapor. So first we took a uh, tip enhanced Raman scattering uh, map uh, with 638 nanometer laser and we got quite nice high resolution image with uh, several important uh, features in it. So first of all we clearly see uh, signatures of molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide far away from the uh, from the junction area. And uh, more importantly, the transition area between the molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide, the width of this area is not uniform. And you can see that, uh, for example, here, uh, the width of this transition area is few hundreds of nanometers, mm -hmm. while in this area, the width is actually, as we will see uh, further down the presentation, is pixel limited, so at least 25 nanometers, or probably less. What was interesting, uh, another interesting feature that we discovered here was that this transition area had a very clear uh, spectral signature. So this peak at around 200 uh, wave numbers was absent in molybdenum disulfide, it was absent in tung uh, tungsten disulfide, and it was present only uh, in, uh, in this transition area. Another important signature of, of this transition area was the position of this peak to the right from main A prime peak uh, characteristic for uh, tungsten or molybdenum disulfide. And the position of this peak was somewhere in between the position of corresponding peak in tungsten disulfide and molybdenum disulfide. So we can expect some alloying in this transition area. And uh, the fact that this peak is somewhere in between the position of corresponding peak in tungsten disulfide and molybdenum disulfide can be a measure of the degree of alloying in the transition area. Okay. okay, then we took the uh, terse map image of the same area, the same crystal, but now we switched from a uh, resonant red laser from 638 laser to uh, infrared laser 785. And the, with 785 laser, we are below the band gap uh, for both molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide. And 
again, we collected nice uh, terse map. We can see uh, all the same features in terms of the morphology. So the right uh, width of the transition area in this uh, lateral heterostructure, but the spectral signature is quite significantly different. So now, as you can see, there are no peaks around 200 wave numbers. All of them are gone. Uh, the only peaks left in the uh, terse map collected with, uh, or terse spectra collected with 785 nanometers are main peaks, uh, eight prime peaks uh, for tungsten disulfide and molybdenum disulfide. And this uh, peak that characterizes the alloy as well. Okay, so uh, this uh, discrepancy between the Raman spectra obtained with red and infrared laser actually can be uh, quite important for interpretation of the nature of the peaks that we observe uh, with resonant excitation. Uh, earlier this year, there was a nice paper published in Nature that showed that with uh, non-resonant excitation in gap mode TERS, we are sensitive mostly to the out-of-plane modes. And when we have resonant uh, excitation, we can be also sensitive towards the uh, in-plane vibrations. And uh, the fact that we have the low uh, wave number, low energy peaks uh, disappearing in, uh, in case of non-resonant excitation may be a direct indication that actually all these uh, modes are in plane modes that we are not observing with non-resonant excitation, which, which is sensitive only to the out of plane modes. Okay, now uh, let's talk about the spatial resolution and another interesting observation that we made in the torus imaging of these lateral heterostructures. So as you can see, and as we discussed already earlier, uh, the width of the transition area, it was quite different along the uh, heterojunction of the same crystal. And uh, we can clearly see that when we integrate and average the terse response of the spectra uh, on the tungsten disulfide side, immediately adjacent to the transition area, molybdenum disulfide and the pixels in between corresponding to the uh, uh, transition between molybdenum disulfide core and tungsten disulfide, disulfide shell, uh, we have uh, very clear signatures of uh, tungsten disulfide, molybdenum disulfide, and this transition area. The thing that actually was quite striking was the fact that the position of this peak, which is, as I mentioned before, should be sensitive to the alloying ratio in the transition area was the same in broad, uh, in wide transition area and in this very narrow realistically pixel limited one, which assumes that the composition of this uh, alloyed material was the same both in narrow and wide uh, locations. And this is quite surprising. Uh, to be honest, uh, whether there is some self-stabilizing alloy ratio or whether the molybdenum disulfide, uh, or sorry, tungsten disulfide, when it's growing outside, sort of eating out this uh, alloy area, it still needs to be understood. But the fact is there that the spectral signature of the alloy area was practically the same, both in broad, uh, transition areas and in pixel limited transition areas. Okay, so that's, uh, we covered the Raman imaging of transferred materials. Uh, I'm also proud that we managed to directly image the distribution of tip enhanced photoluminescence along the edges of uh, molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disulfide, heterostructure. Uh, this is not a really easy measurement. Uh, we do not understand uh, really well why it's so difficult to do on Sapphire, 
because on the silicon silicon dioxide it's quite conventional uh, measurement and we have number of beautiful results on tip enhanced PL imaging of uh, different structures including lateral heterostructures but when these structures are grown are grown on uh, sapphire for some reason the measurements become very complicated probably it has something to do with the fact that quite often sapphire holds a lot of static charge and that may affect either doping or may affect somehow the tip enhanced uh, photoluminescence uh, imaging itself. But anyway, uh, in this uh, crystal, we managed to uh, directly image the distribution of this uh, transition area uh, along the junction between the molybdenum disulfide core and tungsten disulfide shell on as grown sample on sapphire. And the width of this transition area was found to be about from 150 to 200 nanometers which is quite consistent with what we uh, observed in the uh, tip enhanced Raman scattering uh, maps of uh, similar crystals. Okay, so of course we are running multiple collaborative projects uh, with our prospective and existing customers. And uh, we were lucky to have a uh, sample, actually control sample uh, for a different project uh, that we were doing with uh, guys from Florida, group of Dmitry Varonin and Seful Handaker. Uh, and uh, the control sample was also a molybdenum disulfide, tungsten disulfide heterostructure uh, grown pretty much uh, in a similar way. And um, when we transferred this uh, crystal to gold and ran uh, first uh, AFM characterization, we observed very similar picture to what we observed on, uh, in the samples prepared in Alabama. So molybdenum disulfide core, tungsten disulfide shell. And when we ran the tip enhanced Raman scattering map of this junction area, again, we observed the same spectral signature as we saw in uh, samples that we discussed earlier. So appearance of this peak at around 200 wave numbers, 200 and uh, 210 wave numbers in the transition area, which in the case of this specific crystal was about 100 nanometers. Another interesting observation that we made in this uh, sample was the fact that the intensity of the peak here at around 178 wave numbers was decreasing as we moved away from the junction line between the molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide. So this observation actually made me very happy because first of all, uh, I was able to do it at all. This result, by the way, was obtained uh, exactly a week ago, which is nice. And uh, also it showed that uh, the spectral features that we observed in the transition area between the molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide in uh, prior samples, they were not uh, strictly sample specific. Uh, they are more general and that gives us hope that at some point we will understand perfectly well uh, which exact vibration these uh, peaks correspond to and how to assess the composition of this transition area by the position and the intensity of these uh, specific peaks. Okay, with that, we'll come to the conclusion on the terse characterization of molybdenum uh, disulfide, tungsten disulfide lateral heterostructures. So thanks to advanced sample preparation and the nanometer scale spatial resolution of the gap mode terse imaging, we've been able to demonstrate the presence of an alloy area next to the borderline between molybdenum disulfide and tungsten disulfide in the heteromonolayer crystals. Spectral signature of this transition area was found to be similar on samples prepared in two different groups. We showed that the width of the transition uh, or alloyed area may vary from hundreds of nanometers and down to less than 25 nanometers. And surprisingly, it looks uh, that the composition of this transition area and the position of corresponding peaks uh, in Raman spectra of, of this transition area is the same for broad and narrow 
uh, lines. Torus spectra of the same crystal obtained with 638, 70, and 785 nanometer lasers were quite significantly different. And such uh, difference may be important for uh, assignment of observed Raman bands and in general for assessment of the dispersion and the density of states of phonons into the materials. Okay, so now we can switch to uh, instrumentation again, and I will present the new addition to, or new option in our Omegascope line of products. Uh, now we have, starting from this year, an environmental chamber uh, that can be attached to a megascope uh, instrument, which allows to conduct the terse measurements or tip enhanced PL measurements or any AFM measurements uh, under protective atmosphere. So we can uh, purge this volume with uh, inert gas, thus eliminating water vapors and, uh, and uh, oxygen. And uh, this allows us to work with uh, oxygen and moisture sensitive materials like black phosphorus, uh, tellurides, and other important uh, two-dimensional semiconductors, which perish very quickly in normal ambient condition. Uh, the additional advantage of this uh, attachment is the fact that now the positioning of the AFM relative to the uh, objective scanner or relative to the focus of Raman laser is fully motorized. So uh, with this instrument, uh, our customers will have even more uh, ease of use because now it will not be necessary to touch the screws on the uh, input-output system uh, for, for the preliminary alignment. Everything is motorized. And uh, after the sample is loaded and the tip is loaded, realistically, uh, the person does not have to be in the lab. Uh, the, experiments can be run remotely. Okay, and in the final part of my presentation, I would like to tell you about the exciting product from our partner company, Kunami. And uh, this instrument is designed for uh, nitrogen vacancy based magnetometry. So the idea of uh, of this uh, technique is the following. Uh, if we create in the diamond uh, so-called nitrogen vacancy when one atom of carbon is replaced with nitrogen atom, uh, this vacancy is a photoluminescence response. First of all, it's very bright and it strongly depends on the magnetic field uh, in the vicinity of this uh, vacancy. And as a result, if we add of the RF uh, excitation to, to, uh, in the vicinity of the apex of this uh, probe that has a single vacancy, uh, then we can probe the distribution of uh, magnetic field in the sample based on the spectral signature on, based on the dependence of the uh, photoluminescent spectrum uh, on the RF frequency with which the junction of the tip and the sample is excited. And the ultimate sensitivity of this technique was claimed to be down to actually a single spin of an electron. Therefore, this technique allows us to measure distribution of the magnetic field even in uh, normally very weak uh, magnetic materials like antiferromagnetics, superparamagnetics, and so forth. And uh, here are the layout uh, of the uh, experimental setup and uh, some uh, first results that were obtained on, uh, on this instrument. Uh, one in every pixel of the map, we collect the full spectrum and then we can reconstruct the distribution of the magnetic field, even in very uh, weak uh, magnetic materials, as I mentioned before. So this instrument, Proteus Q, uh, is a brand new product from Kinami, uh, which is distributed in the United States by Hariba. And uh, I'm really, really excited about this new opportunity because it 
uh, this instrument really opens up new possibilities and characterization of uh, many uh, interesting nanoscale magnetic features in modern materials. So uh, possible immediate applications, nanomagnetism, spintronics, topological magnets, skermions, magnets, and so forth. Uh, of course, modern uh, uh, hard disk drives and so forth. Uh, if you are interested, please uh, get in touch with us and we'll do our best to provide more information about this new exciting technology. And with that, we are coming to a grand conclusion that properly integrated scanning probe microscopy and optical spectroscopy instrumentation and methodology provides unique capabilities in nanoscale physical and chemical characterization of different materials. In particular, to semiconductors and uh, the lateral or vertical heterostructures comprised of them benefit greatly from the capability of TERS and TPL to cross-correlate physical uh, optoelectronic properties and the structure provided by Raman uh, spectra. New capabilities of Hariba instrumentation are being introduced on a regular basis, and we are happy to present this year the controlled atmosphere TERS TPL upgrade and together with our partners uh, from QNAMI, new exciting uh, nitrogen vacancy-based magnetometry instrument. Thank you very much. And if you have questions, please uh, address them to Mark Shinyo, who is our uh, global product manager for FM Raman products in Hariba, to myself, or send it to uh, info at scientific at hariba.com. Also, please check our recent uh, application note on characterization, correlated characterization with TERS, TPL, and scanning probe microscopy of uh, other 2D material that I didn't cover today in my talk. With that, I would like to thank you, and I will take questions if there are any. Thank you, Andre. I mean, that was a wonderful talk. I haven't seen the data on the magnetic instrument yet so thanks so much for sharing um i think we can spend another 10 minutes or so we have a number of questions over here i'll read those to you the first one would be how hetero monolayers affect the band gap of 2d materials so apparently in this uh structure we have a transition from the normal band gap of uh, of one material to normal band gap of the other material. And then depending on the mutual position of the, of the uh, bands in corresponding materials, we'll have uh, type two, type, uh, type one, type two, type three uh, alignment and corresponding PN junction. But more importantly, uh, depending on the alloying in this material, uh, the band structure can be actually quite different. And uh, that's why I think it's really, really important to uh, understand at nanoscale what kind of junction we have. And the great um, advantage of a uh, combination of uh, SPM and uh, optical spectroscopy is that we can probe this uh, interface at nanoscale without killing the sample. So we can do these measurements multiple times. And also we collect uh, kind of useful information in terms of whether it's uh, surface potential, conductivity, photocurrent generated uh, through this junction and so forth. Something which is pretty much impossible to do in uh, TEM. All right, thank you. Our AFM, Raman, PL, and CPD maps acquired at the same time, and with what tip? Uh, so they are not acquired at the same time, uh, but uh, they are acquired with the same tip. So uh, conductivity map, uh, Kelvin map, uh, uh, capacitance maps, they are all acquired with, uh, with the same tip, which is used for uh, tip enhanced Raman scattering or uh, tip enhanced uh, photoluminescence. All right, thanks. Another one here I see what is the typical acquisition time for a terse map, similar to what you've seen for the MOS2, WS2? 
So it depends on the spectral density and how good the tip is. Usually, I prefer personally to have fairly dense terse maps, uh, meaning that I have at least 100 pixels uh, uh, per line. And uh, usually, this kind of map takes about from 20 to 40 minutes to collect. Okay, moving to the next one. Can we use TERS to test protein-protein and protein ligand interaction? Actually, yes. And uh, I think that uh, Patrick, who will be presenting next, uh, just published a paper on uh, TERS characterization of proteins. So general answer is yes. Uh, it's not as straightforward and it's even way more complex in uh, biological samples compared to 2D materials. But uh, the ultimate resolution that TERS has already demonstrated, uh, intermolecular resolution, uh, it directly indicates that uh, at some point when the technology progresses even further, we can uh, address biological samples nicely. Great, thank you. I have two questions here that seem to be connected. So what's the spatial resolution of TEPL on TMDs? Can you do both linearly polarized and circular polarized TEPL with similar spatial resolution? So uh, in terms of polarization, actually in um, tip enhanced uh, experiments, the polarization will be governed by the dipole moment of the of the tip itself. So uh, realistically, I'm not sure whether the original polarization will stay in the enhanced signal. So I, I understand where it comes from, uh, but uh, in the tip enhanced PL, we should remember, or tip enhanced Raman, we should remember that the uh, electric field even if we have some sort of uh, in-plane uh, components in, in the incoming field, the signal that we collect will be governed by the uh, field which is perpendicular to the sample and which is pretty much along the, uh, along the uh, terse probe. The spatial resolution wise, uh, I would say, also, it depends on the sample prep. At the moment, uh, it's fairly difficult uh, to have tip enhanced PL in the gap mode regime when uh, the signal is very strongly enhanced. It's difficult, but not impossible. And I think that Tom will, will show that in uh, about one hour. And uh, with that, spatial resolution can be as good as few nanometers. Uh, without gap mode, I would say the spatial resolution will be limited to the radius of the tip. And uh, at the moment, probably 20 to 60 nanometers, well, 20 nanometers is a bit challenging. I would say something like 50, 60 nanometers, that's more realistic. But also depends on the sample and the signal to noise ratio. Mm hmm Another question says here, excellent presentation. In Thank TPL, you. how to compromise between quenching effect and enhancement effect? Well, uh, that's actually a very good question. And uh, it comes down to how to make perfect sample that would preserve both. And we are actually working on that. Uh, I can tell that I did see samples that preserved both when we had uh, Team DC crystals exfoliated to gold that somehow uh, preserved PL as well. And PL signal was very strong in that case. So uh, it is possible, I know that for sure, and it's uh, realistically the question of the sample preparation. So finding the spacer between the 2D material and the metallic substrate that would, on one hand, decouple uh, the transitional metal decalcogenite or any other uh, to this semiconductor from the surface 
and in the same time uh, would be narrow enough or uh, shallow enough to preserve the enhancement provided by uh, by the gap mode uh, terse or tip enhanced PL uh, construct. So that I know for sure that it's possible. Uh, we do not have uh, ready 100% reproducible solution, but we are working on that. Okay, thank you. Um, let's take maybe a few more. I don't think we'll be able to go through all of them. Can you elaborate how the automatic centering of the metallic tip in the center of the laser spot is achieved and how does the feedback loop work to keep it there? So uh, when we do the alignment, uh, the final alignment of the laser and the apex of the probe, uh, we do the objective scan uh, objective scanner map. So we raster the position of the laser focus across the SPM probe and we focus uh, or position the uh, laser focus uh, to the point of strongest terse or tip enhanced, uh, tip enhanced BL signal. And then uh, we, because the objective scanner is uh, actually a closed loop scanner. This alignment stays uh, uh, stays in place for very long time. Uh, if for any reason there are temperature gradients in the room or uh, something else happens, we also have the tools that would allow to compensate the drifts if they are present. Uh, sometimes, especially during the summertime uh, here in Bay Area, when you start working, it may be quite chilly. And by the middle of the day, the temperature can rise quite significantly. So sometimes we do see those drifts, but most of the time, uh, I would say the uh, system stays stable for hours. Uh, and that's the beauty of the uh, solid design that we have in our instrumentation. All right, thanks. Um, there is a number of questions over here that I'm going to pull into one, which is basically asking for environmental conditions. So can we do these kinds of measurements in fluid, particularly in liquid electrolytes? Can we do it on biological materials? Can we do it in a very low temperature? So low temperature at this moment, not yet, uh, because that requires uh, ultra high vacuum conditions. Uh, in liquid, yes, we do have liquid, uh, uh, liquid cell. And uh, Patrick, who will be the next speaker, actually published several papers on beautiful terse results obtained in liquid. Uh, so answering those questions, uh, yes. Uh, the, Electrochemistry as well. Uh, we just started. It's, uh, as you can imagine, uh, quite a complicated experiment, but uh, uh, we know for sure that our customers are working on that. And uh, since we got measurements successfully done in uh, just water solution, uh, it's uh, we have very high hope that uh, even the electrochemical environment uh, will be doable as well. What is the importance of the MOS2, WS2 interfaces or their alloys to justify these studies? Well, it's uh, in, in this case, uh, I, I'm not claiming that uh, for final product or uh, final application, exactly these two materials will be used, but it's, uh, it's a convenient model to uh, investigate the possibility of creating uh, junctions between two different semiconductors at nanoscale, because uh, with the perfection of the synthetic process, and actually it has been already demonstrated as I showed in my, in my talk, the uh, transition area can be pretty much as narrow as a few atoms. And uh, having a possibility to create circuitry uh, with uh, in atomically thin layer just 
varying the composition uh, in play. It's an amazing, uh, uh, amazing opportunity. So thin film uh, electronics, uh, thin film uh, photovoltaics and so forth, all that can be done uh, hopefully at some point with, with these exciting two dimensional semiconductors. Mm. All right, let's do maybe two more. I don't wanna stress you too much and the rest can be addressed offline. Is it possible to obtain gap states information from TERS similar to what can be obtained from STM? So first of all, uh, we can run TERS measurements with STM feedback. So we, we can do both. And uh, in terms of the uh, measuring the density of states uh, in these experiments, as I mentioned, uh, I think that if we have a uh, sufficient number of excitation lasers and uh, we have proven that uh, our probes can work from, uh, gold-based probes can work from 594 nanometers and all the way up to uh, a 30 nanometer excitation and uh, silver-based probes can work starting from green, uh, just analyzing how the Raman spectra or Tur spectra change as a function of uh, excitation wavelength. I think that we can have very interesting and quite unique information about the properties of the materials. Okay. I really enjoyed the talk. Thank you. Do we have any idea what caused the peak around 200 inverse centimeters in the transition area? Uh, not yet, not yet. And uh, th these results are very fresh. I can say that uh, the uh, results obtained on the sample from uh, Florida, actually it's one we called, and uh, results obtained on uh, samples from Alabama, they, they were just obtained a few months ago. We do not have good uh, explanation at this time. And actually even the interpretation of some peaks that we observed uh, in the third spectra of tungsten disulfide, uh, for example, the those narrow peaks uh, at around 140, 178 wave numbers, the explanation that one of those peaks, I believe, was assigned to out-of-plane vibration and the fact that it disappeared in 785 nanometer terse map, actually, I have some suspicions that that interpretation that we found in literature may not be exactly correct. So peak assignments in um, two-dimensional semiconductors, it's still a job that needs to be uh, addressed by theoreticians, and I hope uh, it will be done sooner or later. It's kind of challenging thing because uh, it's a complex uh, system with uh, excitons playing an important role and uh, the mere density of the peaks uh, in, uh, in these uh, materials is uh, quite compl complicates the picture uh, quite dramatically, but it is important. And without understanding why we see those peaks and what those peaks mean, uh, there will be no uh, real progress in the characterization. But at this time, at least we are uh, glad that there are some well reproducible spectral signatures. And then uh, based on this reproducibility, we can start thinking uh, on working with our uh, theoretical partners uh, on the interpretation of the nature of those peaks. All right, and the last question, short one will be, can TERS map a virus? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, I think yes, at some point. And uh, also it depends on what part of virus you want to image. We can extract RNA and I'm quite sure that uh, with uh, current progress in terrorist methodology and instrumentation, at some point we'll be able to sequence uh, the DNAs and RNAs on uh, pretty much on demand. Uh, our customers in Texas and m published earlier this year a paper on uh, DNA uh, sequencing based on uh, based on TERS, 
and uh, I think that we will get there at some point. And same thing with proteins. It's it's more complex. Uh, it may require uh, a bit different methodology. But uh, if we look at the progress that TERS made during last five years, uh, when uh, literally in early 2013, having a TERS image, it was almost a guaranteed publication in a very good journal. And uh, by the end of 2014, just in our application lab, we generated more terse images than the rest of the world put together during previous 10 or 12 years. And uh, that was the pace of the progress. And I think that uh, we, we have many exciting developments uh, ongoing right now, and I'm quite confident that uh, TERS will become a very universal characterization tool for a number of materials, not only semiconductors, uh, biological materials, uh, electrochemistry, and you name it. Thank you so much, Andre. I mean, thank you. Fantastic talk. Um, there are several outstanding questions that uh, you can either continue answering in the chat Q&A window, or you can take, I can send them to you later offline, uh, so you can contact people who did not submit them anonymously by their email address. And uh, let's take a five minute break and then we're gonna move on to Patrick. Thank you so much. Thank you.